So um, my name is Councillor Philip Bell. I'm, uh, as um, Benjamin said, I've formerly worked uh, as a consultant in the oil and gas industry. And I, that doesn't make me a bad person. It actually makes me understand what's going on with energy. Um, so th this, this first slide kind of shows you just a, um, a, a very, um, just, just gives you a very um, quick idea of uh, just uh, of the, the range of transport that we've got in, that we have here uh, in Aberdeen, uh, ranging from a hydrogen car to a hydrogen fuel waste truck, to the co-wheels electric uh, battery car, uh, and to a road sweeper, in fact, we've got two road sweepers. Um, so the oil downturn in, so this is where I, I'm setting, kind of setting the stage. So the oil downturn in 2014-15 added fuel to the transport fire. Uh, and it was about this time that the FCHJU, that's the Fuel Cell Hydrogen Joint Undertaking, uh, approached our city to see if we were prepared to pilot hydrogen fuel transport. A joint venture was undertaken between eight organizations that included Aberdeen City Council, BOC, Van Hool, who made the original buses that we had, and the, the uh, EU's FCHJU and uh, high trek organizations. So um, to continue to make Aberdeen a successful place, our strat strategies have to align with those at a national level. The Climate Change Scotland Act calls for a reduction of 80% of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 uh, compared to 1990 levels. The National Transport Strategy calls for reduction emissions to tackle climate change. Whilst air quality, health improvement and our national planning framework outlines how Scotland should be a low carbon place. In transport terms, this means that low carbon transport options are further developed to encourage our residents and visitors to use them in increasing numbers. The take up of low emission vehicles will have an important part to play when we want to encourage greater use of electric vehicles powered by hydrogen or batteries. So this is recognized in uh, various um, uh, transport strategies that we have. Uh, in terms of commitment to low carbon vehicles, uh, we've been installing uh, public, uh, public electric vehicle charge points across Aberdeen since 2013, and now have 75 publicly available charging sockets incorporated with it within 45 units, 28 of which are 22 kilowatt so-called uh, fast charge units. For hydrogen, we're quite unique in Scotland and have the only hydrogen filling stations available to the public offering fast refuelling at both 350 and 700 bar pressures. The IPCC Special Report of October 2018 laid bare the realities of climate change and what is required to alleviate it. And for the sake of doubt, the world is now at plus 1.3 degrees C average temperature increase from pre-industrialization baseline. And the Arctic is now at plus four degrees C average temperature increase. I put a couple of numbers um, on this slide to highlight UK CO2 emissions and where they're derived. But the UK only contributes 1% of global CO2 emissions, 1%. In 2019, the UK committed to net zero by 2050, and this is enshrined in law. And we now have the 26th Conference of the Parties, known as COP26, being hosted in Glasgow in November, more of which in a few minutes. In case any of you thought that electricity is a simple commodity available to power all of the electrically powered stuff we see emerging is simple, think again. The electricity network is highly complex and very strictly controlled and regulated. The electrical power is derived from large machines with lots of inertia, providing stability for the grid from sources such as nuclear and combined cycle gas turbines, from many renewable sources such as solar PV and wind, from pump storage to provide so-called peak load lopping at times of high demand, and from seven DC-DC interconnector links, and you'll see why I'm saying this in a wee bit. You may recall a substation associated with a French link with a French link burst into flames two weeks ago, taking two gigawatts out of the UK network. And to put that into context, a new nuclear power station will be, will be rated to produce a little over three gigawatts. So the interconnector loss was very significant. Two years ago, a large wind farm trimmed off, tripped off the grid. 
and together with the combined cycle gas power station also tripping off the grid caused chaos, not least for rail transport, which couldn't be restarted once power had been restored. You may, have rec you may recall that. So the ACC strategy to develop at hydrogen and fuel cell power transport utilizing private wire to renewable sources starts to make sense. It not only removes the dependency on the national grid network, it also reduces the cost of the electricity to produce the hydrogen in the first place. And this is a, I couldn't resist uh, showing, you, uh, showing you this. So in simple terms, hydrogen, so stored hydrogen is combined with oxygen in the air within a device called a fuel cell. It generates electricity and water in the process. A vehicle will incorporate many fuel cells and hence significant amounts of elect electrical power can be generated. Aberdeen's, now this is a very significant um, bit of information. Aberdeen's new double deck buses use approximately 18 kilos of hydrogen to power them all day. They can be refueled in 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Time is running out for my presentation, but I thought I would give you a summary of the current scale of publicly available low carbon transport in Aberdeen. And you will notice I have made reference to the requirement for new build residential and non-residential -res property to have charging infrastructure incorporated in, in it. Now this hydrogen hub is a potential game changer in Aberdeen. You might be interested to learn that a company called Element Energy carried out a study for us in late 2018 and after consulting with our partners uh, and potential future users came up with, with what we consider a very conservative figure of the number of hydrogen fuel vehicles we expect to see on Aberdeen's roads within the next couple of years, together with, with additional hydrogen supply that will, that will have hydrogen cost parity with diesel and petrol. Just now, hydrogen costs about £10 a kilo to produce. It needs to be down to £6 a kilo to be equivalent with petrol and diesel. Uh, sorry, and now to COP26. The promise of shutting down all coal-fired power stations and not building any more is great, but the recent two gigawatt interconnector failure, Drac's coal-fired power plant was restarted and brought back online. The UK government have very recently, recently refreshed plans to build six large nuclear power plants and 16 SMRs. An SMR uh, is a small to medium reactor, which is rated at about a half a gigawatt. So the Six large nuclear power plant would provide about 18 gigawatts. Um, the uh, small to medium reactors would produce about another eight gigawatts. Now, these numbers, please, please just you know, bear in mind. The UK government has stated that they have a target of 18 million heat pumps to be installed by 2050. And we know heat pumps are very efficient. But now here's the, here's the sting in the tail. The majority of heat pumps installed in a very well insulated property will require at least two kilowatts of electrical power. And that equates to 36 gigawatts in installed capacity, 36 gigawatts. Uh, if we want to have um, the, all the heat pumps that the UK government is actually wanting to have and that everyone thinks are completely wonderful. Battery electric vehicles will need significant amounts of electrical power. Will that all be supplied at off-peak times between half past midnight and half past four in the morning? I wonder. A wall of money is neither use nor ornament if it is, if it is not targeted at a project. I would hope that COP26 identifies projects, ensures, ensures they are efficiently run, makes engineering companies available to identify projects, manage those projects, ensure the projects are maintained, and does it with some haste. Thank you.